people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ in his one precious Holy Spirit. Amen. Today you and I have the opportunity to reflect on the Word of God. Today's lesson for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from Matthew, the 21st chapter, beginning with the 33rd verse. If you've been paying attention, you will remember that this follows immediately upon last week's lesson that ended with the 32nd verse. So for those of you who missed last week or those of you who've forgotten, Jesus has taken over the temple. He is healing and teaching there. He has cleared it of all those who are engaged in commerce all those who are engaged in money changing. He won't let anyone carry anything through the temple. It has become his place. The chief priests and the elders come to him and they ask him two eminently reasonable questions. By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus uh, challenges them to answer him a question about the authority of John the Baptist. When they refuse, he begins telling stories, parables to them and to the crowd around. Last week we talked about the parable of the father with the two sons, where the father tries to send both of them to the vineyard. One says that he will not go, but then changes his mind and goes. The other talks good, but never actually obeys the father. And Jesus tries to bring that point home to the chief priests and the elders that the world is filled with a whole lot of broken, messed up people who have finally listened to God and finally shown up to do the things that God calls them to do. And even when the chief priests and the elders see that, see that kind of redemption, that kind of movement of God's spirit, they still don't do what they're supposed to do. They still don't respond to Jesus' invitation. In his answer, Jesus challenges them to do their jobs. He's respecting them enough to confront them. He respects them enough to expect that they will recognize the movement of God in the world. They will say and do the things that they have been trained to say and do. And when they fail, Jesus doesn't give up. Jesus continues to teach. He continues to preach. And we see something magnificent in Jesus here, that he doesn't give up on anyone. He does something that we almost never see, in fact. He argues and entreats and pleads and cajoles these people using the themes and language and sensibilities that belong to them. When was the last time that you heard a Democrat try to reach a neighbor who is a Republican using the themes and sensibilities that motivate Republicans? When was the last time you heard a libertarian use the language of socialism to try to reach a socialist and to bring him or her on board? It doesn't happen among us. But Jesus uses the themes and the images and the language and the scriptures of those he's trying to reach because he is desperate to give them the opportunity that he gives us, an opportunity for life, for forgiveness, for peace with God, even his enemies. He doesn't write them off. He doesn't speak in words or themes that they don't know. He doesn't expect them to, more, to know more than they do. The Bible says, you know, that God wills that none should perish but that all might have eternal life. And Jesus lives this right in front of us, right in front of people who have declared themselves to be his enemies in the face of their hatred, in the face of their judgment, knowing that some of them are actively working to kill him. He calls them back to scriptures that they know, to revelations of God that they accept, things that they ponder, things that they teach. He tries and he tries and he tries and he tries. We're going to get to the lesson of the day in just a minute from Matthew's Gospel, but I want you to recognize what Jesus is doing, what he is weaving together before we get there. And, and for today, he picks up two themes that would have been precious to the chief priests and the elders, two things that they knew in their bones to try to reach them, to try to bring them home. He appeals to Psalm 118. 
This is a psalm about the goodness of God, about the faithfulness of God who rescues us. A psalm about someone who is low and then uh, is, is brought up or is recognized as a central part of God's plan. It's a psalm that should help them to recognize Messiah should help them to recognize that Jesus standing right in front of them is the Messiah. Here, here are some of the words that you should listen for in Jesus' teaching today. This, so out of Psalm 118, starting at verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is hoping to slow them down, to have them think that this person, this witness, this prophet that they're about to throw away, may in fact be the one about whom this psalm was written. Isn't that astonishing? He also appeals to something out of Isaiah chapter 5. There's an allegory that the prophet Isaiah used to try to explain to Israel the meaning of the approaching Assyrian army. The Assyrian army is coming they are about to completely undo Israel. Judgment is coming. Won't you listen, Isaiah says. Won't you hear even now as your literal doom approaches? The army is right there. And Isaiah tells Israel this story. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I'll tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice but saw bloodshed righteousness, but heard a cry. So Jesus takes these two traditional lessons that the chief priests and the elders would have learned as small children, which they would have thought about weekly for their entire lives, which they would have taught to other children, which, which they would have used in leading the worship of Israel. He takes these two and he, he weaves them together into a plea for those who conspire against him, that they listen and be transformed, that they be brought from death to life, that they would know the grace of God and enter God's peace, that they would remember the devastation that comes through disobedience and the joy of God's redemption. So finally, let's hear together Jesus' teaching from Matthew, the 21st chapter, as he appeals to those who are rejecting him. Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated, him in the same, they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, well, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it's amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. 
The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You understand what Jesus has done here. He has done everything that he could do to speak a word of warning and a word of promise, a word of identity and a word of hope, a word of explanation to these who have set their faces against him. It's a remarkable thing. And in doing it, he goes back and he answers the question that they asked him earlier, the one that we began with last week. Who are you? By what authority do you do these things? Who gave you that authority? He identifies himself. I'm the son of the father. I'm the heir. I'm the one to whom all things have been given. I'm the one who knows the heart and the mind of the Father. I am the Messiah. And I have come to you and for you that you might finally do what's right. That you may finally be who you were created to be. Don't miss Jesus' love here. Don't miss his awareness of what will soon befall him. Don't miss that he embraces that painful destiny for you. Today, in this lesson, the beloved son, the heir, the Messiah, calls to you. Will you respond to his gifts and his grace with obedience? Will you recommit yourself to the path of justice and righteousness? You've been given the vineyard. You've been welcomed into the family of God. This is not your own doing, but a free gift, freely given. But now that it is yours, what will you do? Lord Jesus, fill us with grace and boldness and love that we might serve you joyfully and honor you with our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.